do you believe is the biggest lesson parents should take from the Rutgers coaching scandal? You know, I think parents need to get the lesson that this kind of derogatory behavior happens at all levels of sports. And that parents need to ask their kids directly if they experience it and take action if, if it does, if it does happen. I think too many parents put their head in the sand about it thinking, well, it's toughening him or her up for the real world. You know, I work daily with kids who have experienced this kind of emotional abuse and it really does affect them. Now, to be sure, some kids aren't affected and handle such coaches just fine, but you can't know if your kid is one of those or not. And parents often make the logical mistake of thinking that a tough coach worked for them or, or a tough parent, and so it should be good for their kid just the same. The kids are not miniature versions of their parents, as much as parents might like that. They're unique individuals with a completely different makeup than anyone else. Now, what are some of the not-so-obvious signs of a bad coach that some parents might miss? Well, like when a coach shows bias toward the better players with regards to praise and encouragement. A smart coach works to boost up his weakest players. That's what you look for as a parent. A coach who shows uh, with words or body language, approval or disapproval based on performance in the games. Now we're talking about little kids. This is the kind of coach who does that uh, even more in practice um, when you parents aren't looking. And, and, and this is troublesome. Some coaches that deal with older kids have been known to be a bit aggressive and use yelling and screaming to get their instructions across. Should parents uh, always avoid sending their kids to coaches who use this kind of technique? Craig, don't coaches have to be a little bit tough? Well, it's true, coaches can be aggressive, loud, and tough, and be very effective without being emotionally abusive. Let me give you some examples. Um, you know, abusive coach tears down a player with yelling and screaming. A coach interested in getting more effort and attention from a player could yell or scream or be aggressive with, uh, you know, words like this. Jones, I know you're a great player and you're so close to your greatness and I know you want to see that as much as me, right? Or how about, there is more hustle in you right now than you're giving show the team how bad you want your success, right? Get in the picture. Your competition is working harder than you right now. You've got to ask yourself if you're willing to give it everything you've got or you want to do this halfway and let somebody else raise a trophy above their head and take your place because they go the extra mile. Hard work, effort, learning, paying attention will always pay off in more playing time on this team. You see, it's totally fine for a coach to be passionate and maybe even raise a voice if that's the style. It's the intention behind the yelling and the screaming that matters. What are you really trying to get across? Coaches will get much more out of their athletes by inspiring them rather than tearing them down. Famous coach John Wooden, more NCAA championships than anyone on this planet, said about yelling. Think about this. Quote, I never yelled at my players much. That would have been artificial stimulation which doesn't last very long. I think it's like love and passion. Passion won't last as long as love. When you are dependent on passion, you need more and more of it to make it work. It's the same with yelling. That's right, John Wooden, one of the winningest coaches of all time. Now, what are some of the attributes of a good coach? Athletes have told me consistently that knowledge of the game gains the most respect from them. I would say, personally, from working with coaches and parents, that flexibility is the most important attribute of a coach. Meaning, one-size-fits-all coaching methods on every player ends up wasting talent. Because every player is different and respond, they all respond to different motivations. The best coaches learn about people and continually seek to understand the personalities of the players. They know that the athlete isn't just a sports machine and what happens to them off the quarter field affects their play on the field. A great coach supports the player in all areas of their performance. So how can a parent give tips to their child on a sport without interfering with what the coach is teaching? Switching back to the parents now. I write a lot about this in my free ebook, The Ten Commandments for a Great Sports Parent. Uh, and you can get that by going to mentaltoughnesstrainer.com. Well, basically in it, I write that parents need to ask the, ask the child if he or she would like tips on their sport and when they would like them. 
When giving tips, the parent should just ask the child if this is any different than what the coach teaches and, and how it's different. And the parent can certainly go to the coach and ask about the methodology, then make a decision on whether or not to go forward. You know, there's plenty of coaches teaching methods that don't work for every athlete, and it's the parent's right to decide what they want their child to learn. Parents need to be in charge of their child's upbringing, of course, but they also need to be self-aware that they don't have all the answers either. In other words, you want to make informed decisions about your child's sports participation, but don't just assume you know, the, know best without knowing all of the facts, so I encourage you to go get that. Parents, coaches, there's a few tips for both of you <laughs> and parent coaches. Get out there, stay awake, Learn as much as you can. The more you learn, the more you work with your child. If you're a parent, work with your coach. The better off you'll be, the more your child will reach his potential. I'm Craig Sigal. Let's do this.